Hello, everybody. Welcome to tonight's lesson. We're going to have a good one tonight. And I'm just waiting for it to finish up with the, uh, for whatever reason, it didn't. There it is. We're going to uh, be talking about the book of Genesis. We're going to get into a little bit of introduction and then take off right with it. So um, feel free. Lots of comments tonight. And let's get into what the Word of God has for us, because I think you're going to begin to see Jesus in a lot of different ways and be able to start looking for Jesus throughout the Old Testament. So a uh, couple prayer needs. We need to pray for Brother Jim uh, Lothian. He is really struggling uh, just kind of to come out of it. We know that he has pneumonia. And there's a number of other things that are happening. Of course, he's he's not been in great health for the last several years, but we want to uh, lift him up in prayer because we really need for him to come along. Um, and it, I think it's a uh, it's a good thing for us to pray for our country. A lot of things happening all over the place with that, and uh, and pray for our church because I believe that we are at the uh, the crest of the hill and about ready to enter the rest of the Lord as far as um, people beginning to, to catch the word. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, give us wisdom and understanding tonight. Father, we pray that you would open up your word to us like we've never seen before. Father, there is so much about Jesus in the Old Testament. We just want to realize your goodness. Show us Jesus in every way that we might have a better understanding of who you are. We want to know the, the nurture and the nature and the character of our God. Father, we thank you for touching Brother Jim Lothian. Father, bless him tonight. Bless him, Lord God, with health. Give him a revelation of his healing. Father, and I just pray in the name of Jesus, strengthen him from head to toe. And for Brother Don Andriaco, Father, I just pray that you'd sharpen his mind, that you would strengthen him from head to toe, Father God. Build up in his spirit. Lord God, a, a desire to see the goodness and glory of God at every turn. Father, just give him boldness to, to improve his, his body and his health. We speak over him health and wholeness in every way. Father, we pray for our nation, for those that are in charge of our country, for the church, the body of Christ in this country. Father, that it would rise up and begin to preach the word, being instant, in season, out of season, reproving, rebuking, and exhorting with all long suffering and patience. Father, we just thank you and praise you for it. We ask you, Lord God, in Jesus' name, teach us tonight. We give you praise. Amen. All right, let's get started. We're looking at the book of Genesis tonight. Um, this is, I think, going to be a, a really good... Um, a good way to start out, and I and I want you to grab hold of some of this stuff, and we'll just start with Colossians two sixteen through nineteen. It says, therefore, do not let anyone judge you with respect to food or drink, or in the matter of a feast, new moon, or Sabbath days. These are only the shadow of the things to come, but the reality is Christ. Now, understand here what he's saying. He he's talking to some Hebrew believers. And as well as, because the Colossian church was a mixed bag, it was Hebrew believers and it was Gentile believers. So he's talking to both of them, and there was a bunch of judging going on as to who was keeping what feast and new moons and Sabbath days and all the different regulations between the, the Gentiles who came out of a lot of different pagan religions and then the Jews who were still trying to enforce the law. They had gotten saved. They, they believed in Jesus. They believed what Jesus did, but they were still trying to enforce the law. So Paul here says, listen, everything we know out of the law is a mere shadow of things to come. But the reality of everything is Christ. Then he says, let no one who delights in humility and the worship of angels pass judgment on you. That person goes on at great lengths about what he has supposedly seen. But he's puffed up with empty notions by his fleshly mind. Man, there, there you go. <laughs> Can you imagine saying that to somebody at church when they start going on and on about this, that, and the other thing? You know, sometimes the most spiritual people, the people who will just talk your arm off about spiritual things, are the ones the furthest away from truth. 
it, I, I, listen, I've been in ministry since 1985. I have seen a thing or two. I, I feel like that farmer's commercial, you know, we, we know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. And and it's just the way it is. There, there are people who, who get puffed up in, in some spiritual experience that they have. And they, because they're puffed up in that, that they, they're really bypassing everything we know about Christ. And it's just kind of a, like he says, a fleshly mind. Listen what it says about them. He has not held fast to the head from whom the whole body, supported and knit together through its ligaments and sinews, grows with a growth that is from God. Paul gives us, I mean, this is some great insight as we start getting into the scriptures to guide us through these types and shadows throughout the Old Testament. All things written in the Old Testament that our ordinances for the Hebrew people are not the reality. They're mere pictures. They're just what it says. They're types and shadows. They are in some way simply um, that they, they represent some portion of the picture of Jesus Christ. That They're not redemption. They're not Jesus. Because you throw a prayer shawl around your shoulders and come in, or you bow in a certain way, or you worship in a certain way, or you blow up, a horn, a ram's horn in a, in a service, doesn't make you a Hebrew. It also does not make you any closer to God because the reality of everything, everything, Old Testament, New Testament, the reality of everything is Christ. He's it. The, and anything that does not lift him up, does not magnify him, anything that doesn't um, exalt who he is, it is really false doctrine. And if we would understand that it doesn't matter really, let me let me paraphrase this or put it in the right context so that you understand it. And, and I'm not saying we can go out and do anything we want because clearly the scriptures says we cannot without there being consequences to our actions. There's natural consequences in the, in the earth to all actions that are not of faith. So it, we, but the reality is, that anything we do in everything that we do, unless somehow it is it is something that is in Christ, it is useless. You can be as religious and go through as re many religious ceremonies as you want to do. If you leave Christ out of it, it is useless because everything that we know and do, everything that is part of our being has to be rooted and grounded in Christ. Take a look here at um, – there are those, and, and this is a, a thing we have to watch for because there are those who assimilate that the whole of the scriptures are mere allegories, and these, these folks are misled. It, there, is, there is teachings out there that say the Old Testament didn't really happen. It, it's, it's all stories. I heard this when I was going to Bible school. And, and I heard it when um, I was in some conversation with people who were in seminary, who actually in Christian seminary, who were convinced, not because of what they read or understood from the scriptures, but from what they were told and led into by professors at Christian universities, seminaries, what they were led into, that nearly all of the Old Testament or allegories, or stories. There isn't a lot of reality in it. Um, these people have not had, they've not held fast to the head. That's supposed to be held, by the way, not head. They have not held fast to the head, which is Christ. The historical accounts of Yahweh's dealings with Israel are true, and they're real events. And how many of you have gotten into or read through uh, like some archaeology, you know, uh, biblical archaeology or some of those magazines that are out where they're, I mean, they're actually going through the Holy Lands, Lebanon, um, all through Israel, Egypt, and they're, they're digging up artifacts and things, and they continually are coming up with things that absolutely, I mean, 100%. 
without any ap- apologies needed, prove out Christ. They prove out everything that's in the in the New and Old Testaments. We know that the the uh, Quanram scrolls and the Dead Sea scrolls. They found them. There were a lot of people sitting on pins and needles. They just couldn't wait because they they were believing that this was going to disprove all of these old, ancient, ancient, older than anything they'd had before uh, scrolls. That they they believed that they were going to disprove things of the Old Testament, things written, things we had in our Bibles. The contrary became true. They absolutely proved that all of the things that were written in the in the scriptures as we know them old testament scriptures were i mean unapologetically true and accurate of course they had to come up with other things to say about them but the accounts we read um the accounts that we read from are um they've been given to us so that we might understand the person and the character of the Godhead. Another typo there. From um, everything that we read from, they've been given, and they've been given to us so that we would understand who God is, who Christ is. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 10, 11. These things happen to them as examples and were written for our instruction on whom the ends of the ages have come. The history that is written of the Hebrew nation it is not a an allegory. It's an actual historical account, but the actual historical account is something that we can learn from. And, and I know you guys have heard it, that you know those who uh, reject history are, um, are going to become victims of the same things, you know, it, because history repeats itself, everything that we know of from from history, we know that it we can learn from it. it. When people say, "Oh, this is unprecedented," no, it's not. Solomon said, "There's nothing new under the sun. There, there isn't anything." Ed says a lot of people believe what these priests and preachers tell them, and don't look at the word to see if they were correct in telling them the things. Yeah, it's exactly right. It, there's a lot of false teaching out there. So much of the false teaching surrounds things that are in the Old Testament. And, and people, they don't dig in. They, they don't uh, bother to learn. And, and I've, you know, I've had friends of mine who have told me, well, I don't see why you even preach out of the Old Testament. There's no use in it. The New Testament is where we find salvation. That, the New Testament is where we learn everything. Um, yeah, Mike. Mike Kelker has a, has a good question for us. Do we really learn from history? Look at the world today, Mike. I I think we do look at history, um, and there are some who learn from history, but there are most people who ignore history, and and that I think that's why. Um, I think that's why so many people today just they, they seem to scoff. And, and they come up with these big phrases to say, oh, this is something's never happened before. It's unprecedented. Everything is precedented. Everything. There, there is nothing on the earth today that is without precedent at some time in history. Nothing. And it doesn't make any difference what type of government we're under, whether it's a, you know, a dictatorship or a democracy or a theocracy. Everything that we know of has already happened. It, it really has. People say, well, you know, it's because of technology today, it's not just not possible. You know, we this this is unprecedented because we have all this. No, that back in the day, you know, they probably thought wheels that rolled were an unprecedented thing. The real truth is Adam and Eve were brilliant people. Absolutely brilliant. They named all the animals in the garden. They named all the flowers, and they named them accurately. Um, and and think about the people that built the Tower of Babel. The people that built the Tower of Babel had to be phenomenal engineers. Way better than the engineers we have today. I mean, they built a tower to reach to the heavens. And 
Yeah, Mike, it is. It is people uh, rewriting history and, and trying to disprove the word of God, watering it down. Um, but my dad says they add things that did not happen. They, yeah, they do. They absolutely do. Um, and, and yeah, the dad, they didn't have a good level. Well, I, I don't know because the tower of Babel was huge and, and it did reach to the, to the heavens. I mean, it, it was as high as anybody could ever imagine. And God toppled the whole thing over and then confounded all the languages of all the people. Now, when we start thinking about things like that and and we start adding these things up, like if we all had one origin, think about this now. Let's just say that everything the evolutionists say is true. Everything that everybody says about we all crawled out of, you know, the swamp and, and we came up onto the earth and, you know, uh, somehow we, we eventually turned into men. Um, if it all happened in the same region, as most scientists believe it did, it happened in the Middle Eastern region. If all life in that began then in that place, wouldn't it make sense then that all peoples everywhere would speak a very similar language? I mean, it might have some little variations to it, depending upon your district, just like English does. I mean, you go to the hills of Tennessee and West Virginia, you can't hardly understand the people, but they're speaking English. You go to New York or New York, you, you know, the people there speak a different dialect of English than we do. And uh, yeah, Mike, it is like, where did the chickens come from? Uh, the, <laughs> but, but do look at the discoveries that we found and, and go to the word of God because you'll find them all there. And when people, when people have said that, oh, this is unprecedented. Just look at history. It's not. Now, as we go through some things, we're, we're going to learn some great things here. Hebrews 8, 5 says this. The place where they serve is a sketch and a shadow of the heavenly sanctuary. Just as Moses was warned by God as he was about to complete the tabernacle. For he says, see that you make everything according to the design shown to you on the mountain. Listen, Moses went to the mountain. Now think about this. It takes seven chapters to describe Moses' meeting on the mountain. Seven chapters. It takes one chapter to describe the creation of the earth. Whoa. Moses goes to the mountain of God, meets God face to face. Moses is given the design of heavenly things that he might show us a portion of what awaits the believer. He was bringing it to Israel. In that Moses was given specific things to write in an act in Israel for us to know the depth of God's relationship with us. Exactly, Mike. God wanted every detail correct. And he spent, now he spent seven chapters, 40 days that Moses was there. He created the earth in seven. Seven days. All the stuff that's in the earth, he created in seven days. And the seventh day, he didn't create anything. He rested. We'll get to that at the end. But it took 40 days of Moses being up and God speaking to him nonstop for 40 days for Moses to get everything. I believe, and, and there are other people like Joseph Prince and, and uh, other people that I've read recently who have said during that entire 40 days, God was speaking to Moses about Jesus. And from what Moses wrote down, we can see it. Because everything that Moses writes, and Jesus says this, listen, all the law is speaking about me. So everything that Mo Moses learned in 40 days, he was learning about the Christ. Now, he may not have understood it in totality that way. And I doubt that he did. He certainly understands it now. But he was writing about Christ. But it took him 40 days to, to take all that in. Think about, think about what God put in those first five books. Wow. Yet, yeah, Ed, you're absolutely right. Moses was probably astonished. Um, and I, I don't know if he met Jesus or not. 
I, I know that when he appeared um, and the disciples said, hey, let us make two tabernacles or three tabernacles here. You know, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and, and one for one for Jesus. Think about that. They they recognized Moses, and Moses was meeting with Jesus. Woo, buddy. And Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible from memory of what God taught him in 40 days. We got a lot of things we can find out from that from those first five books. Now take a look here at Hebrews 9, 23 through 24. So it was necessary for the sketches of the things in heaven to be purified with these th- with the, with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves required better sacrifices than these. So he's talking about this, the difference between the sacrifices that the Hebrew people knew, because he's writing the Hebrew people, the sacrifices the Hebrew people knew, and the sacrifice that Jesus made, the one perfect sacrifice. The heavenly, the, the earthly things were just sketches of the things that were already in the heavenlies. That they, they weren't the the complete fulfillment of it. They were just sketches. That they, they were just um, a foreshadowing of the things that would that were happening in the heavenlies. And the things here on the earth had to be purified with blood, the sacrifice, blood offerings. But the heavenly things themselves required something better than what was happening here on the earth. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with hands. The representation of the true sanctuary. But into so, so you see what he says there? The sanctuary that Moses knew about, the sanctuary that Moses uh, created in the wilderness when he built the tabernacle of the wilderness, when later on Solomon built the temple, they were a representation of the true sanctuary. So if we want to know what the true sanctuary is like in heaven, doesn't it make sense that we ought to study the sanctuary of Moses and the sanctuary that Solomon built? Since David went to God and said, let me build you a house. I mean, down here, you don't have a place to stay with us. Let me build you a house. God said, no, I'm not going to let you. But I'm going to let your son build a house, and I'm going to tell him how it's going to be built. I'll give him an, an exact, an exact replica of what it looks like in the heavenlies. And everybody who came to see the original temple that Solomon built, were, they were aghast. At what they saw, they could not believe its beauty, its architecture, um, the the richness that it was covered in. I mean, the inside walls of it were completely covered with gold, and not just any gold, pure gold. And the pure gold that was beaten in large sheets into perfect forms and placed in there, and not one hammer, not one chisel, was used inside the temple itself. The stones were brought there. All the gold was brought there. It was all brought there and put up without there being any of man's labors installed in it other than placing it in the place. How did they do that? We still don't know. We couldn't build it today. And I've read several different accounts. The description of the temple as Solomon built it People are saying today there isn't a a country in the world that has enough money to build the same thing. (coughs) So it's what what was built here was just a super or was was just a representation of that which is the true sanctuary. And it says, For Christ not enter a sanctuary made with hands, but into heaven itself. And he appears now in God's presence for us. Jesus didn't enter the sanctuary here, but he entered a heavenly sanctuary where he also poured out his blood, just as it was poured out in the earthly sanctuary so that we would understand. There is so much information in the in the sacrifices, in the, the blood being poured out, all the ritual that the priest went through. All of it um, tells us, you know, all those pages in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, in the book of Numbers, all of those pages tell us what Jesus fulfilled in his coming. 
So if we really want to understand what it is that we got, like I told you last week, the disciples understood it because they had no New Testament. They had no scriptures to go on. Jesus told them everything that they needed to know that became the New Testament. He told them out of Old Testament scriptures. It's amazing. Look, take a look at Hebrews 10, verse number one. For the law possesses a shadow of the good things to come. When have you ever heard anybody talk about the Old Testament law as being good, right? I mean, I preached it. The law, the law is bad, man. It it displays sin. It it exposes sin, right? Here in Hebrews 10, 1, we find the law possesses a shadow of of the good things to come, but not the reality itself, and is therefore completely unable by the same sacrifices offered continually year after year to perfect those who come to worship. So, so here we see really an amazing piece of scripture that Paul lays out for us. The law possesses a shadow of good things to come, but not the reality itself. Just that statement tells us that through our study of the Old Testament scriptures, through the study of the law, which is um, Genesis, Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, through the study of those five books, we can see a shadow of the good things to come. Not the reality itself. But we see a shadow. We, 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 we see through glass darkly, but then face to face. We, we see a piece of what's going to come. But it's completely unable. By all the sacrifices offered continually, it, it is completely unable to perfect us. The only way it can perfect us is if it points us to Christ. This verse I mean, I'm telling you, this one verse here, it is it is an inescapable key for we believers. Even though the law was true, real, and practiced by the Hebrews, it was incapable of removing sin. Ed says this is why the devil came with Baal and Molech worship, to draw the people away from God's law. You're, you're exactly right. It Everything that the devil has done it has come to us is a distortion of the law. Even from the beginning, has God said? Think about that. The very first thing, the first law God ever gave, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, exactly, Mike, in the world today. Uh, think about this. Exactly, he's the master counterfeiter. Good, good word, Richard. He is. Think about this. Now, I, I, this is intriguing. The first law that God gave Adam and Eve it was what? Somebody type real quick for me. What was the first law God gave Adam and Eve? Come on, somebody, somebody's got quick fingers. Somebody can, somebody can lay it out. What, what's the first law? Don't eat of the fruit, right? Ah, Richard, good insight. Eat anything except the tree, right? The first thing God gave us, the first law God gave us is, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, right? It's the first law. It, was that good or bad? See how we see how we're twisted? Yeah, good. Of every God's first commandment to us as human beings was not a bad commandment. It was thou, it wasn't thou shalt not. It was thou shalt, right? Thou shalt eat of every tree of the garden. He even told them it was all good for him. He said, All the herbs, all the fruit, it's all good for you. Right? Told him that, yeah, Ed, he told him tend and keep the garden. What's that mean? Live in it. <laughs> Live in it. Take care of it, eat of it, enjoy it, um, don't ruin it, right? It, it was all good. Eddie did not say cut the grass. <laughs> but 
It was a good command. Then he said, but, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, because in the day that you do, you will surely die. I, it, it's amazing. It, it's amazing what the word gives us. The very first commandment was a good thing. Yeah, then came the snake. They should have ran over the snake with that lawnmower, right, Ed? No, Dad, it was not a buffet. <laughs> Yeah, Mike, they did. They died spiritually. They absolutely did. They died spiritually. That's why, look at what he says. The law possesses a shadow of the good things to come. I, For most of my Christian life, I, I have thought that the law is absolutely bad. Yeah, Richard, they did. They passed the, the death to all of us. That the death penalty got passed to all of us by their one disobedience. Thank God for for one act of obedience. Um, but the this law, if we will look at this law now, because keep in mind this is an old saying, um, not not an original by any means. Um, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. So as we start getting into the Old Testament, read the Old Testament with eyes of grace, with a mind of grace. Look for grace in the Old Testament, in particular, the first five books of the Bible. Look for, look for grace because you will find grace everywhere you look. And you will begin to see all of the good things that God intended for us. You know why Jesus, I, I was thinking about this. You know why Jesus was so powerful? So powerful. I mean, Jesus was a man. He had to be 100% man in order to do what he did. He could not have been the redeemer without being 100% man. So, so here he comes. He's 100% man. The only thing that he possesses, maybe different than us, is an understanding of the Old Testament. He understands the covenant that God made with man. He understands all the covenants that God makes with man. He understood the Mosaic covenant. He understood the Abrahamic covenant. He understood the covenant he made with, with Noah. He understood all the covenants. Nancy, great point. Most of the law was given to preserve God's own people from harm, physical and spiritual. Great point. Yeah, Mike, they didn't get it then. And that's why Jesus uh, repeat it, hoping that they will get it the second time. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, Richard, excellent, excellent point. The reason why Jesus knew that. Think about this. Jesus... A carpenter's son goes into the, at 12 years old, goes into the tabernacle or goes into the, um, the holies, into the inner court, not the holy of holies, but into the inner court where Hebrew people were allowed to go after their, their purification. He, he goes in there, he meets with the teachers, and he confounds them with his knowledge of the Old Testament. Now, he didn't go to Hebrew school. He didn't spend his time in a seminary. He didn't spend his time, um, you know, being trained by by a specific rabbi, like somebody like Paul was. He Gamaliel gobbled him up when he was a young man and began to pour into him the scriptures and his understanding and his interpretation of the Old Testament. Jesus didn't have that. Jesus is a carpenter's son from Galilee. The, the scriptures attest to that. Yeah, being God's son, Mike, you're exactly right. Being God's son, he did have the wisdom. There, there was something inside of him that gave him the ability to understand. And yeah, Ed, they did not get the understanding of redemption. And, and yeah, you're right. Man does think he, he has to work for it now. Jesus had a, a perfect knowledge of grace. He had a perfect knowledge of grace. 
is he's looking and studying. And, and Richard makes a great point. Jesus knew the Old Testament because he studied it. It had to be that way. Think about this. If Jesus is the Redeemer, and he's going to be the Redeemer for all mankind, and he's going to be the Redeemer exactly as the Scripture points out, he had to have the same things at his fingertips as all of us. Jesus had the only thing that was, um, if you want to call it religious, you want to call it Hebrew, whatever you want to call it, the only thing that Jesus had at his hands was the Old Testament Scriptures. That's the only thing. It had to be that way because because he, he couldn't have had some other supernatural thing that was beyond what anybody else had. He he only could have had what all the rest of us had access to. So Jesus had, yeah, Richard exactly. He was in all ways tempted as we are because he was a man. So he had at his access the same things we had at our, our access: the Old Testament, the Hebrew law. That's all we had. Think about that. How much of our time have we spent? And, and I'm not saying don't read the New Testament by any means. You know, we can go to the New Testament because it's going to reveal everything out of the Old Testament. It's going it's to start peeling the onion layers back one at a time. And we're going to grab out of that Old Testament. I mean, meat, meat that is good to eat. And we're going to grow. We're not going to be sucking milk anymore. We're going to we're going to be eating red meat, and and taking it in. Um. Yeah, Mike. Jesus said that he was before Abraham. That's why he, he was familiar with all the covenants. But but he still has at his access as a human being the same things we have. Whoa. It might tell us what we need to start doing, right? Take a look at. In, in uh, Acts 7, we're going to drop in on Stephen here. This is right before uh, he gets stoned. You stubborn people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. Now, he's talking to Jews here. He's talking to Jews. You stubborn people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. They were certainly circumcised. You were always resisting the Holy Spirit like your ancestors did. Uh-oh. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold long ago the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You received the law by decrees given by angels, but you did not obey it. Stephen, at his stoning, tells the story as to why we need to know the Christ found in the Old Testament. You see, he's calling them out. He's saying, listen, you resisted the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wanted to disclose these things. In fact, Peter, in, in uh, I think it's 1 Peter, it says that the prophets of old and even the angels desired to look into this very thing that has been exposed to us by the Holy Spirit. They desired to look into the salvation. They wanted to know the salvation, but they couldn't get it because it takes the Holy Spirit to reveal it to us, which if you remember right, when Jesus came out of the waters after being baptized by, by John, the Holy Spirit came and rested upon him. People had never seen anything like that. The Holy Spirit came and rested upon him. God spoke out of heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, right? He, he had... He had, because he was the fullness of the Godhead bodily, he had the Spirit. Jesus, there, with the Holy Spirit resting upon him, he's, he's got, I mean, he's got understanding. He's got everything. He's got an understanding because he's listening to the Holy Spirit. He's not resisting the Holy Spirit. Big difference. Jesus is listening. Oftentimes we're resisting, right? Why did he say? What, what, did, he, what did Stephen here say? Stephen, listen, Stephen was a man filled with the Holy Ghost. Stephen was a man who, who before he stoned, looks up to heaven and surrenders up his spirit. They didn't even have an opportunity to kill him. 
as soon as they they'd start to throw rocks, he says, Father, in your hands I commend my spirit. Gone. Out of here. He gives up the ghost. Now, think about, think about that. He says to them, right before all this happens, you're stubborn, you're uncircumcised of heart. You resist the Holy Spirit just like your ancestors did. The difference for, for Stephen, Stephen is listening to the Holy Spirit. He's doing exactly what Jesus did, listening to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is revealing truth because that's what the Holy Spirit does. Now let's get into Genesis. Genesis 1.1. 1, .1. And that Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was fully God. I'm reading now the Net Bible. The, the Word was with God in the beginning. All things were created by Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that, was, that has been created. So the Word created all things. And we know clearly that the Word was Jesus, because later on in verse number 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Our first clear reference to Jesus in the Old Testament in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God there is Elohim. It is the plural, the plurality of God, which is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, Genesis 1, 3 through 4, God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light that it was good. So God separated the light from darkness. These first verses give us a glimpse at good and evil. God calls the light good. He also created the light with his word. Notice he did not have to create the darkness. I never thought about this. I, I mean, I really did not. I, I never thought about this. God never had to create the darkness. Darkness always was. It was there. God never created the darkness. Darkness is a void. It's, it's a place without the presence of God, although God is everywhere. So what, what is darkness? Darkness always was. Man does not need an incentive to fall toward darkness. We, we really don't. We don't need an incentive to fall toward darkness. We just naturally do it. Don't ask me why. You say, well, pastor, I just can't believe that. I can't believe that men just do that. Okay. John chapter 3, verses 18 through 19. The one who believes in him is not condemned. The one who does not believe has been condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Now, how did you all start out? Did you start out believing or did you all start out not believing? I'm talking about before your salvation. Before your personal salvation, did you start out believing or not believing? Not. Not. Yeah. Thanks, Cindy. Not believing. <laughs> we we didn't start out believing. We started out not believing. And he says here, now this is the basis for judging, that the light has come into the world. But listen to this. And people loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. People love the darkness. I, I don't know why, but we do. <laughs> Good point, Ed. You can hide in the darkness. You can't hide in the light, can you? Um, God did not have to create the evil. He didn't. Like Adam and Eve, we begin not believing when the opportunity is presented. Genesis 1, 6 through 8. Then God said, let there be a firmament. I taught about on this a uh, couple weeks ago. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Water is a cleanser in scripture. It's also representative of judgment, which is cleansing. You don't need to be clean if you're not dirty or you don't need to be cleansed if you're not dirty, right? So the, the water is 
is both a cleaner, but it is also a judge in that it is removing it. You know, water is recognizing and removing dirt, if I can just say it that way. So the water is a cleanser in the scripture. The there's two waters here, the waters under the firmament, the waters above the firmament. The Hebrew root, root word for firmament is rakia, which comes from the root raka. It means expanse, but the root specifically refers to an expanse of metal that has been beaten thin and into shape. God called this firmament, this firmament that's been beaten thin, this piece of metal that's been beaten thin and, and put into shape, he called that heaven. Ed says he didn't create evil. It didn't come until Satan started thinking about putting a throne above God and rebelled. That's when evil started, don't you think? Actually, I, I think I think the the pride thing was always in man. It, it was it was always in man. I I think if I, and I'll, I'll show you a couple of scriptures later, a little bit later, but I think Adam and Eve. Um, could have avoided the whole thing if they'd have been together, if they'd have been of one mind, uh, because they, they would have corrected each other, but they didn't. And separately, and maybe this is why there's so much divorce today, separately, um, men are prideful. I'm talking about men and women. Uh, mankind is prideful. And they will gravitate, I think, toward darkness when left on their own. Um, so, so here we see this, this firmament. God calls the firmament heaven. And it, it isn't a coincidence that the Ark of the Covenant was covered with gold that was beaten thin and wrapped around the shittim wood. Not that Jesus, our Heavenly Savior, was beaten to keep us from judgment. He wasn't beaten to keep us from judgment. Um, the firmament kept the waters of judgment that fell in Genesis 6 upon the earth to destroy it from falling on mankind. So that firmament, that, that beaten thin firmament that went between the waters above and the waters beneath, the waters above actually fell in Genesis 6 upon the earth and destroyed every one of living kind, destroyed every one of them, but it only fell once. They only that that judgment only fell once when God separated the waters of cleansing because water was was never meant to be a, a judge. Water was meant to be a cleanser, a nourisher. If you know um, anybody that's studied like you can't live more than three days without water. You have to have water. You can live without food. You can't live without water. We need water. Our our structure is mostly water. Water was was meant as something that was going to bring nourishment into us, bring nutrients into us, and it was going to replenish the body. Um, your brain uses most of its water uh, to cool. It's like a radiator. Water going through your brain cools it. When when you're dehydrated, you start to get delusional because your body starts shutting things down to try and cool the brain. When the brain overheats, that's when you have strokes and things like that happen. Yeah, 70%. You're exactly right, Dad. 70% of the water in your body cools the brain. 70% of us is water, I think. So um, when God separated the waters, this, this is, I mean, just such an interesting thing here. God's account of, account of, in God's account of creation, every day he says is good, except the second day. He doesn't say the second day is good. He just merely says, and that was the second day. He says he, he created a firmament. It separated the waters, the waters above and the waters beneath. That's the second day. There's no proclamation of it being good as in all the other days. Now, here's my question for you all. Did God know that the flood would soon was soon coming through the waters he removed from, from the earth? That's not from the earth. It's from the earth. Typo again. I, I was working quick today. Um, did God know 
that that flood was coming. Yeah, he did. He, he knew it was coming, right? And he later says he's no longer going to destroy the earth with water. He leaves all the water here. God didn't remove the water. The earth absorbed the water. You know, it got brought up into the atmosphere, but the firmament was then gone that divided the waters from the waters. And now we have the sun coming through. Water was intended to nourish our bodies and the earth to be a blessing. And it's also the water of the word that cleanses us. Water was meant to be a good thing. The firmament, though, separated that which judged. I find it really interesting that Jesus now separates us from judgment. He separates us from judgment. Just like, just like the firmament. He is a beaten work that separated us from judgment. So that we're no longer judged. It fell once. Judgment fell once in Christ. And that was it. Yeah. What water is life, and that's what it was always meant to be. Take a look at Genesis uh, 1, 11 through 13. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth forth grass, the earth that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit, according to its kind, whose seed is in itself, on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Do you think it's a mere coincidence that Jesus, is, that Jesus, who is life, rose the third day? He rose the third day. God creates life the third day. The herb yielding seed. Now, here's what I find interesting about all this. Trees and the fruit of the ground, in other words, you know, uh, wheat, peas, corn, all of those things, they, they produce seed, right? What do the seeds do? What do the seeds do? Hmm. I need a, I need a ticker, you know. They die, right? Okay. What happens if they fall and germinate? Exactly, Mike. Don't they reproduce life? Don't the seeds reproduce life? And Jesus said he was going to be that seed, right, that fell to the earth and died and reproduced life. It happened the third day. Yeah, Nancy, and it, seeds put forth roots. What, what does Jesus do in us? Puts forth roots in us, right? We, we have all kinds of things going on as a result of everything that Jesus did. And do you, could God have created the animals the third day or man the third day? Could he, could he have created something else the third day? Why the third day does he, does he produce life? Grass. Everything is, yeah, everything is three. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. You're, you're right about that, Ed. But here's God, and on the third day of all things, he creates all of this life, and it's life that he He points out many times. It's got seed in, in it. Guess what we have in us, seed? Don't we have the fruit of the Spirit? Yeah, Nancy, nourishment. Don't we have the fruit of the Spirit? Yeah. All of its seed. And God said he saw that it was good. The evening and the morning, the third day. Yet yeah, your seed does create. That's exactly right, Dad. Your seed creates. Which is exactly what God said on the third day. No wonder he called it good. And it's the same Jesus rose on the third day. To bring life to a barren to a barren land. I mean, let's face it. Until then, we had water and earth. We didn't have any. We didn't have any grass. We didn't have any life. Yeah, and he provided the food. That's exactly right, Mike. He provided the food before he, mankind and animals. 
So, and he no, notice he does say that. Ed is a great point. He says, after its own kind, when Jesus rose from the grave, what does that say about us? What does the scripture say about us? Aren't we going to rise in like manner as him? Jesus told the disciples that. He says, hey, you're going to rise in like manner. You're, you're going to come up just, just like it. He tells through the scriptures, the dead in Christ shall rise first. He preached that at Brother Jim's funeral the other day. The dead in Christ will rise first. Once the seed dies and falls to the ground, it rises again. It's life. Jesus intended for what was barren to rise again. That's a good word. Um, I think, I think I probably will stop right, right there because I, I got a whole lot more in Genesis. I do. I mean, I, I, I just have a whole bunch more. We're not even out of Genesis one yet. And, and Genesis is packed. I mean, packed full of in the beginning stuff that cause you to start thinking. And, and I got some stuff about Adam and Eve and, and that, that, I think you're gonna you're gonna see a little bit clearer why we're in the predicament we're in, and and why we don't really truly understand everything that Christ did for us on the cross. It it's amazing the stuff that God had planned. This all works out into a gigantic master plan, but you can't take all of this and say, oh, it's all an allegory. This all actually happened, but is it is all a foreshadowing, so that we would understand the character of God and who he is. Well, blessings, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Good crowd. Uh, man, some great, great comments tonight. I, I mean that. Some really good stuff. Tom, Pam, Nancy, Mike, Joyce, Dad, Eileen, Ed, Cindy, thank you all for joining us. Um, keep spreading the word. Keep telling everybody. Uh, they need to jump on. Next week, we're going to jump into a little bit more of Genesis 1, finish off, get to Genesis 2 and 3, and, and we're going to be off the races through a whole bunch. We'll be talking about Joseph later on, Moses later on, Noah later on. I mean, there's there's so many types and shadows of Christ just in the book of Genesis. Uh, I, I think you're going to start seeing a, a much clearer picture of, of who your Savior is and then who you are in him. That's the important part, who you are in him. Not outside of him. People can teach, be the best you you can be. Well, you don't want to be the best you you can be. It's still flawed. <laughs> be the best Jesus you can be inside of you. Amen. Y'all have a great night. Blessings.